Hi, and welcome to the X22 Report Spotlight. My name is Dave, and today's guest is Eric Sprott. He's the chairman of Sprott Inc. and the chairman of Kirkland Lake Gold. He also has his website, SprottMoney.com. Welcome to the Spotlight, Eric Sprott. Hey, Dave. Good to be with you. Thanks for coming on, Eric. Let me ask you, and we'll just start off with Greece because it's all in the news. Uh, this is Everyone is talking about it. And we see right now that Greece is might not. I mean, they might not make their 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 next payment today. And we're seeing that they're going to hold a referendum on July fifth. Do you think Greece is going to actually end up leaving the EU? Well, it's it's a big question, and it's a very difficult one to answer. In the sense that I thought that the um, the Europeans would uh, finally come to the table and bail out Greece, and the reason I thought that was. The ECB has 89 billion euros at stake in the Greek banking system, and I find it sort of ironic that we're arguing over 7.2 billion, which theoretically theoretically would help the Greek economy, which uh, the Europeans are reluctant to provide, and yet almost on a daily basis they were putting an extra billion into the banking system, which says to me that they think the banking system is more important than the country. Um, and so I thought that uh, they wouldn't want to have the banking st system destroyed because they get more on the line there than they have in uh, in the uh, amounts of money that they're discussing for this next form of bailout. Uh, it's very difficult to keep up with the to and fro on this. You know, as we speak, apparently, you know, Greeks you know, the Greeks have come back with another proposal. Uh, they closed their banks. Um, I still believe that it's probably in everyone's best interest. Well, if, if I was one of the central planners, I, I would want to try to keep the thing functioning uh, because one of the uh, things that happened has happened post Lehman is that no one's ever been um, asked to liquidate anything. Lehman was a liquidation, and the liquidation nearly wiped out you know, the capital system that we had at the time, and subsequent to that, no one was ever allowed to liquidate, and whether it's Fannie or Freddie or AIG or, you know, the Greek banks were uh, made the depositor take the hits so the banks didn't have to start selling things because it's the selling of assets uh, that causes the contagion. And, you know, ever since the 08 financial crisis, no one's ever been forced to sell anything and realize what the true value of assets are. And that's kind of what props up the financial system, that we don't question the value of the assets that the various banks had, even though, as we all know, they don't have to mark them to market anymore. And therefore, when we see the statements, we're, nobody's really sure of, uh, of where everything's going. So I've always thought that uh, somewhere along the line, they'd, they'd find a way to uh, just theoretically solve uh, the Greek uh, financial crisis. And then somehow the ECB will take this $89 billion, they'll, in my mind, put it up in the cloud, and no one will ever see it again, and no one will ever write it down, even though it's probably worthless paper anyway. Mm -hmm. But because it now resides with the ECB, they have their own accounting rules, they're not responsible to anybody, and the problem just kind of disappears. It's like Fannie disappeared, and Freddie disappeared, and GM disappeared, and you know, and somehow they skate through. So that, I still believe that uh, they won't, cause something which has some uh, manifestation of liquidation because it could spill over into uh, other jurisdictions. So you, uh, let's just talk about that for a second. If, let's say, this they, Greece does default and they decide to leave the Eurozone, do you think other countries then would follow? What, I mean, what, what do you see happening? Well, it'd be interesting because uh, you know, Greece is in a very desperate state, as we heard whatever number of months ago it was, I mean, when uh, the finance minister said, we're broke. And I find it very interesting that the same comments came out of the people from Puerto Rico yesterday, we're broke, and we just can't pay. And and that's the reality of the situation, and nothing's going to turn that around. So when you're broke and you can't pay, um, probably the best thing you can do is just default on your debt and start over. Just tell everyone here, take your $359 billion of uh, Greek debt and forget about it. We're not paying it. And uh, so I think for Greece, that's the better alternative because in my mind, there's no way they're ever going to be able to pay off the debt. And if they have to, I mean, God forbid they had to refinance in today's real 
interest rate environment for, for Greek uh, paper. I mean, 10 year paper rates trading at 15% or something. I mean, it'd be so broke, it'd be a joke. So they might, I think they would be better by, if I was to advise them, I'd say, well, just go broke, you know, and tell them to forget we're not paying any of the debt and it's over. Declare bankruptcy. Uh, that's what I would do if I was them. I think the, the, uh, ECB would like to keep them uh, running or on the treadmill, if you will, and just keep pushing it down the line. The, the old extend and pretend comes to mind. So we'll see where it ends up. But I think for Greece and, for example, Puerto Rico and for many countries, if they could just repudiate the debt, then ultimately you'd be better off in the long run. Yeah, but it doesn't seem like the ECB, it looks like they're they're not even giving in an inch at this point. I mean... It just seems well, like they just want their there's, money. <laughs> there's a dogfight going on for sure. And obviously, you know, what the, the Troika wanted was some kind of tax increases in the country and uh, spending cuts, particularly pensions. And, uh, you know, the Greeks don't seem to want to do that. So there's a standoff, but uh, it's not to say it can't be resolved one way or the other when push comes to shove. I mean, I think they've both been bargaining pretty damn hard here. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how the cookie crumbles. But uh, I think if I had to advise Greece, I'd just say, look, take the right off and move on. You'll be better off in the long run. Now, we, we see all of this turmoil in Greece, and we see Puerto Rico now reporting something. France is really not doing that well. But we see nothing happening with gold. I mean, gold is just staying static. I mean, is this normal? <laughs> no. <laughs> but nothing in gold is normal. Yeah. Um uh, you know, there was some wonderful work done recently about the uh, derivative positions of J.P. Morgan that have just exploded in the uh, in the commodity markets. And uh, very, very strange things happen on the COMEX with a great deal of regularity. You know, it looks like gold's going to break out and all the commercials come in and short it and they drive it down and they cover their shorts and they move it up a little and they reshort it. And it's like a game. And I... I would almost suggest that anybody who plays options, I mean, it's a dead man's game as far as I'm concerned. And the more people that pile in, you know, you say it's unusual, gold shouldn't be here, and you go buy an option on it, the next thing you know, that's just fodder uh, for the banks to suppress it because if they can keep the place where it is, they're earning the premium all the time. And I think that's what happens in the gold market. And the gold market for a long time uh, has rarely responds to events in a natural kind of way. And I think it's because the powers that be never want a linkage between the price of gold and an event. And we almost have found yesterday very, very surprising. Here we have essentially a weak default and the euro rises. I mean, it was just incredible to see. I think it was down two cents to, to the euro and then it ends up one cent to the euro. I mean, it was the most incredible. The U.S. dollar was weak yesterday. Things that are so counterintuitive that, uh, you have to, um, I think, expect that the powers that be just keep us offside on everything because they are involved in markets. You know, the central banks are involved in markets. Here we have China rallying, what did it rally? 13% today off its lows. I think it was down 7%, ended up 6%. Well, you can rest assured the Chinese government came into the stock market. It's just the way things are now that uh, the powers that be believe they have the uh, the responsibility for holding together the various financial systems on a country by country basis and I think they do that um, so it, it's hard to to rationalize anything that happens and most of what happens seems quite perverse relative to normal logic and I have to sit and read this morning that you know the uh, the uh, UK mint is talking about you know exceptional gold demand. I see the US mint is, has sold a lot of gold and silver this month, you know, with a few more days to get to report for the month, and yet the price of gold goes down. So it's it's all uh, counterintuitive, but uh, gold is the canary in the coal mine. If people had seen gold go up by fifty bucks yesterday, the world would have understood that we have a problem. And that's the one thing that the powers that be don't want the world to believe, that there is a problem, that the, that the central planners have control over everything, that if you run the money spigots, you can control whatever the, the outcome is. And, and so we always have to be faced with these 
uh, irregular goings on in markets, even though logic says, and logic has told us for a long time that gold should be much higher. The demand supply fundamentals seem to indicate for sure that there's more demand than supply, and yet the price goes down. And whether it's the uh, commercial players of just rigging the market, which as you know, most markets have proven to be rigged so far, whether it's LIBOR or Forex or now they're investigating the treasury market. And I know they're also investigating uh, the gold and silver markets. And I, I, I happen to be the one that believes they are manipulated. So it's hard to uh, for me to try to explain to anyone why gold did what it did. <laughs> it's just it's so counterintuitive. But... I think it's the uh, the has the uh, the fingerprints of the uh, central planners being involved. Do you think there will come a time when gold and silver does go higher? I mean, we see now China, oh, the yeah. birth of the AIIB, BRICS, Shanghai Exchange. We see China's bank right. is getting involved with the gold pricing with London. I mean, do you think just with that that it it will drive the price of gold much higher? Well, I happen to be in the camp that believes that the Western central banks mm -hmm. have been selling a lot of their gold and probably have very little left. Um, and, and when I look at the supply-demand statistics every year, my own calculations suggest there might be as many as 2,000 more tons of demand per year than supply. And supply is around 4,000 tons. So I think demand might be around 6,000 tons. And we see numbers out of India and China and even the mine production going down, and you're wondering just how can this be happening that, you know, they can seem to hold the fort. And, of course, most of the holding goes on in the paper markets, which ultimately can only be a temporary thing. Uh, but I do believe that uh, the Western banks have suffered a huge decline in their physical inventories of gold. And ultimately, the physical part of it will win out. So... I am a great believer that the price of gold will go substantially higher. I'm a great believer that most governments are broke, including the U.S. government. That's about the easiest case one can ever make. The U.S. government's broke. Um, but but all, all what's happened here in the last, whatever, 30 or 40 years is we keep buoying the economy by letting people borrow money at lower and lower interest rates with um, – less and less financial criteria for loans so that people who can't afford a car could buy a car, people who can't afford a house could buy a house, and we keep holding it together. And uh, I've never believed in the economic recovery. As you know, the GDP was negative uh, in the first quarter in the U.S. last year. I think it's going to be de minimis in uh, this current quarter. And my big fear for the economy is that I think the inflation is seriously understated. And when you understate inflation, uh, you overstate GDP. So if inflation is really 5% and you say it's 2%, then that nominal growth of 3 is really negative 2. Whereas it, you take the uh, reported CPI off of the 3% growth, you say, well, we grew at 1%. The reality is that inflation, in my mind, is way beyond uh, what's reported by the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. So uh, I think just day by day, the average consumer keeps feeling the heat, whether it's from the health care premiums that are going up, or the deductibles going up, or the co-pays going up, the cost of foods going up. Uh, they just keep getting squeezed more and more. And there's just it's hard to imagine there is any basis for recovery other than you let somebody buy something who can't afford it. Or you give a student a loan who's not going to pay it back. And all these things keep the economy just kind of treading water here. But at the same time, you keep building up this debt, which all countries are doing. And of course, under the old Austrian school, the minute you have to start repaying debt, uh, then your economy starts shrinking because it's been growing with increasing debt. The minute the debt stops growing, your economy starts to shrink, other things being equal. And if, in fact, the debt goes down, now you're comparing one year when there's less money to spend with the previous year when the lending went up, and then the results are, are will be devastating. So there, there are two. You mentioned inflation. There are two camps right now: people who are saying that we're going to see massive inflation or hyperinflation, and then there's other people that say we're going to see no, 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 we're going to see deflation. Which camp are you in? What do you think is going to happen with well, this? Well, it's funny when people talk about those things, there's, there's different things that are affected. For example, in, in terms of asset prices, 
I suspect we'll see deflation because we've inflated all asset prices here by the actions of the uh, policymakers. But I think in terms of the real world and things we do day to day, things don't get cheaper. There's a index that I'll refer to called the Chapman Index where they, I think they measure 500 commodities in various cities, things that people uh, do all the time, whether it's, you know, the, the, the cost of rent or the cost of insurance or the cost of health care, the cost of a haircut, you know, food, things like that. And that Chapman Index, which this uh, gentleman started, I think, back in 08, suggests that inflation is running around 10% mm-hmm. for the things that we buy. <laughs> and uh, so the more, you know, the more inflation you have and you have these very modest wage increases, you just know that uh, the middle class is getting ground down here year after year after year, and therefore we have to keep coming here with more extraordinary measures all the time, and those include, because the zero interest rates, almost negative interest rates, uh, the, the huge expansion in the student lending program, the almost uh, minimal funding to buy cars and houses now. I can't believe we're here we are again in 2015 and the down payments of houses right back where they were in 07. Right. Like it's hard hard to imagine that we're back there again and we think we think the result's going to be different. <laughs> so uh, I don't see it, see it being any different. I, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, discussed this many, many times on my reports about the 0% interest rates and the Fed, you know, they're continually telling us that they're going to raise interest rates. Can you actually see the Fed raising interest rates? I mean, no, what kind of I effect don't. will that have on the economy? Yeah, I don't believe that uh, they can walk the walk. I mean, they can talk the talk all they want. I mean, look, as a gold investor, I've had to listen to this for like two years now. And of course, every time, oh, we're going to raise rates and they pound gold down as though there's some relation to what the Fed says and what the price of gold should be. Uh, but the reality is that you can't afford to raise rates. I mean, even a, a small rate increase, all of a sudden the cost of Theoretically, buying the car goes up, and theoretically, buying the house goes up. And um, so, I don't think they will raise rates. But it's very interesting, Dave. Rates mm-hmm. have gone up. I mean, rates have gone up recently, right? We got the ten-year yes. bond trading at what two thirty, up from a low of I think around one sixty. We see rates rising in Europe now with this, the goings on in Greece. Uh, the market is is somewhat speaking, and I think one of the great exercises is uh, that I recently read a report on in Sweden you know they um, they reduced rates and they thought that it would would decrease the value of the Swedish krona it went up mm-hmm. and and the and the bond rates went up so which kind of means that the market is sort of taking a view of its own of a, the underlying a value of an asset and or the illiquidity of the asset or the risk of the asset which the market should be doing because most of these governments they they haven't had the uh, prudential uh, fiscal policies that would ever suggest that the debt will ever be paid the most basic example of that is the US the US situation where you know they report the uh, the gap deficit every year and it's you know the, the deficit's really about five trillion dollars a year when you when you count all the unfunded obligations that have risen that year because the population gets older, the population gets less healthy, and uh, you get the Medicare costs, it gets old, the population gets older, of course, and the more people are claimants on the system, but it's not funded. So for me, I, I've very often been known to say that the U.S. is broke, and I believe it totally, uh, just like you know, you and I could have sat down 10 years ago and said Detroit's broke, and we'd say it nine years ago and eight years, and finally they go broke. Right. Because the the obligations were in place 10 years ago. The obligations for the U.S. government are in place now. They can't fund them. There's just no way they can fund them. We just diddle along here, ignoring the continued increase in unfunded obligations, of which uh, Professor Kotakoff from Boston University, I guess, is the biggest proponent of it. But... Even the U.S. publishes the data. I think the unfunded obligation present value is $85 trillion. Well, just imagine a $17 trillion, $18 trillion GDP, let's call that the engine. And it loses uh, half a trillion a year, but the, at the end of the year, there's another extra $5 trillion of obligations. I can guarantee you they're not going to meet those obligations. That's just impossible. So how long do you think 
the U.S. government and the Fed, how long can they keep this going? I mean, I know we go back to 2008 and people thought, oh, it's two years. It's never going to make it. And they said, OK, maybe another two yeah. years. And here we are in 2015. But we see things starting to accelerate now. We see problems in Greece that Puerto Rico said something uh, that they can't pay their debt. And we're starting to see things. to ha It's like a domino effect. Yeah. Um, well, see, I mean, it yeah. obviously hasn't happened yet. And Dave, I would go back further than that. I mean, I uh, was very aware that the markets would come crashing down in 2000. And uh, we should have had a big bear market then. And what happens? Well, we come along at TARP and TALF and uh, new home buyer tax credits and Casper clunkers and student loans and food stamps and every other damn thing under the sun to prevent what normally should happen from happening. And uh, today, and since 08, we added a new thing. We print money now. And we have zero interest rates and negative interest rates. And the things they have to do each time around get more and more extreme. And I thought there was an interesting article today by the uh, Bank for International Settlements who was very outspoken about how central banks have themselves in a corner here where their policies can't work anymore. Because uh, we've done the printing, we've done the zero interest rates. What are we just going to go negative here? And you know, I, I just I can hardly even fathom negative interest rates and pension funds losing money every year. And you know, because they get they got they they got to pay interest on the money they have in a bank. I mean, it's just it's it's hard to to fathom it all. To be quite honest with you, so and I did, But from a timing point of view, I don't know when that timing is. I mean. They were going to knock them off one other time here. You knock off Greece, you knock off Puerto Rico. Who knows who will be next, but somebody will be next because we've all just borrowed too much um, and, and to keep our economies going. But the, the day of reckoning is obviously coming. The day of reckoning for Greece came and went. They're not going to pay their debt back. The day of reckoning for Puerto Rico's come and gone. They didn't pay their debt back. Detroit didn't pay their debt back. We're going to see more and more uh, institutions and governments that are in that category here because we, we don't have an, a world economy that's growing to any great extent. So how can we imagine that, you know, if the machine isn't producing more profit at the end of the year or more cash flow at the end of the year, how do we think we're going to pay off increasing amounts of debt? It's an impossibility. So it's, but the timing, I don't know what the timing will be, but it's fairly, easy for me to say, I know where you should have your assets, which is in gold and silver, notwithstanding that what the prices are doing today, because you know anybody with who can connect the dots knows where it's all going to end up. We know where it's going to end up. And there's nothing anyone can do about it. It's just a question of when will the market, you know, react to that sort of thing and 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 correct the pricing of bonds, correct the pricing of stocks, and correct the pricing of precious metals. Two of them go down, one of them goes up. In your mind, do you have like something that would trigger this off? I mean, I heard the White House, the spokesperson said that you know Greece is going to have no effect on the U.S. banking system whatsoever. Don't worry, everything is fine. Um, do you have some type of trigger that is that might cause the whole thing just to come crumbling down like it did in 2008? Well, I think one of the things that I you know I focus a lot on the gold market, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think if there was a, a failure to deliver physically, and there's been some discussion that uh, when the June options expired, that it looked like the Federal Reserve Bank had provided some gold to uh, to J.P. Morgan to settle the outstanding contracts. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll we'll end up with another situation like that somewhere along the line where a, a physical uh, delivery can't be made. And the word will be out, and everyone will know that they have to uh, to go to gold and silver. Of course, by then it'll probably be too late anyway. But you know, there could be a very uh, large reset uh, somewhere along the line. Now, do you think they're going to? I mean, right now we see you know the U.S., the U.K., Europe, I think Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Switzerland. They have bail-in documents. Do you think oh, yeah. here in the U.S. they're going to go? You know, into the close the banks down, go into the banks and take the people's money like they did in Cyprus. Well, you know, everyone has a legislation, right? And mm -hmm. and as we saw two months ago, or maybe a little more than two, no, only about two months ago, um, the ECB told all the European banks, you know, get your bail in, <clears throat> excuse me, legislation ready, and have it ready 
uh, two months hence, and that two month period might be be it right about now. Uh, but it's obviously that the banks are uh, are bigger than the governments because the obligations they have are, uh, particularly when you put in derivatives, are just massively larger than the uh, the resources of the governments. And uh, I think that's what happened after we had uh, things like Iceland and uh, Ireland, various countries had problems, and it it came to the realization of the governments that hold it now. If these banks go down and we're responsible, we're broke. Mm. And that's why they, they had the bail-in legislation, in, which was actually, you know, affected in, in Cyprus because the, the Cypriot government couldn't possibly bail out the banks because the banks are bigger than, than the government in terms of the obligations. So, yeah, it, uh, I would imagine that uh, if there's a, you know, the dominoes start falling, the U.S. banking system is is too levered. I've never believed that banks should be levered 20 to 1. I mean, it's a ridiculous situation that, you know, you got 5% supporting 100%. And if your assets decline by 5%, you have no capital. Well, what's 5%? I mean, we have currencies that go up and down by more than that in a month. Uh, you know, so, and the stock market and bond markets probably deteriorated by 5% this year. Stocks could deteriorate by 5% in a week. So you own these assets, and all of a sudden your your capital is impaired so quickly. And, of course, we've all expected that the governments will come in and bail us out, but the governments now know, hey, we don't have that kind of um, resources. Now, certainly in the U.S., they can just print the money, uh, which they've done on many occasions to uh, bail out the banking system. But um, the, the, that process cannot go on forever before the rest of the world realizes what's going on and you know we see certain governments taking uh, a stand towards gold and silver and specifically re referring to china and russia where they they continue to buy gold and silver because they don't believe in the u.s dollar and uh, i think less and less people believe in the u.s dollar today than certainly a year ago or two years ago and um if all of a sudden people want to you know off those uh, those assets those u.s assets then uh, we can certainly have a, a dollar crisis. Well, let, let me ask you one last question here. What do you think it will look like for the everyday person when things start to fall apart? I mean, what can they expect to see? I mean, what, just this is your, just your opinion. I mean, what you think, how it's going to sure. unfold and what people are going to see. Sure. Well, what they'd see is shortages. That's probably the best way of putting it, right? Because, you know, even in 08, the commercial system, the whole capital system nearly broke down. There was no funding, even for delivery. You know, somebody wants to ship uh, grapes out of uh, California, and the guy wants a, a letter of credit, and he can't get a letter of credit because the bank won't issue it. So the, so the shipment isn't made. Uh, we see articles today about how the uh, store shelves in uh, in Greece have been depleted. Everyone realized, hey, i got to... I got to get rid of this paper that I have in my hand. You know, I'd much rather own something that's real than a piece of paper that may have seriously diminished value in the future. And what happens is people just buy things. I think one of the more stunning things, uh, which country was it? I think it was in Greece, where all of a sudden the sales of valuable cars went up <laughs> because people would much rather own the car than have the money. Because <laughs> at least the car has some value. You know, it has, it has a utilitarian purpose to it, whereas, you know, if, if your country owes $359 billion and they can't pay it, your money's not going to be worth worth nearly nearly anything. It's better to have the car than the money. So here, I mean, are people going to be able to use their cash during this well, time period? Well, for, first, first of all, hardly any people have cash. But mm -hmm. by definition, like currency, they don't have much currency. Okay, uh, the average person has very. The average person hardly could suffer, could survive for two months of uh, kind of a financial shutdown, let alone have cash per se. Mm -hmm. You know, if they lost their job, they don't have savings in the bank to deal with it. Um, I mean, if you want to talk, rather than talk about cash, talk about currency. Yeah. I mean. I think the ultimate value for the U.S. dollar could very well be zero because there's nothing really standing behind it. I always get a kick and well, the government stands behind it. Well, thank you very much. The government stands behind it. That's really good because what does the government do? They just they spend foolishly. They allow the uh, 
the central bankers to print money. Nobody gives a damn. Uh, you know, they hand out food coupons and loans to students who can never pay it just to try to keep it all together. And, and pretty well everything they do is, is massively financially irresponsible. So that's who's backing your currency. And, you know, it's like the Greek, it's, you know, it's the same situation that we're looking at in Greece. So someone said, you know, what's a drachma going to be worth versus the euro? I mean, they probably started like 10, 10 or 20 cents on the dollar is where they'd start. So that's the value of currencies. They can change very, very quickly. Well, listen, I really appreciate you coming on the X-22 Spotlight. Uh, thank you for coming on. Everyone, Eric Sprott, I will put all his links at the bottom of the video. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Dave. All the best. All right. Thank you.